Professor Zone, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming for the class that's going around. When we, when we organize this specialist uh, grand rounds, the lads and I, we've given it some considerable thought as to the topic we choose, why we discuss it. We go to grand round after grand round, we discuss cases, procedures, how to do things. And we sort of wanted to introduce a little bit of a discussion as to what we do, why we do, what can we do differently, and is there a way to improve some things. I think one of the most rubbish books that I was made to read not so long ago was Who Moved by Cheese? It's about 70 pages long. It's probably the most idiotic book I've ever read. And more people in the world have read it than I think the Bible, uh, because it was the craze until about 2004. And, and basically it says change is good. It's done over 70 or 80 pages. And certainly change is good as long as you focus in on the appropriate types of changes and not simply keep on changing directly as a reason, uh, directly from the use of that particular book I'm afraid we were all condemned to having to uh, weekly review our press F. Gaining reports, and we've been sort of stuck in that uh, lingering life ever since. So there are good things and bad things in life that come out of these meetings and books and things that we read. There are two sides to today's presentation. The first one, first one is a, a subject that I think we need to make some changes in our management as an institution, as a division, as a department, as a group. Uh, the second one is a more of a philosophical one. Um, when King Solomon was having his good days, uh, he, won he once had a sad day, so he got his wise men together and he said, uh, uh, I want you to do something that will make me feel happy when I'm sad. And so they came up with a ring, and on the ring's inscription is that phrase that has now been used over the, over the centuries, which, uh, which the popes uh, recite when they when they get inaugurated, which is this too shall pass. And so the point was made to him that you just look at your ring which says this too shall pass in Latin, and the sad days will pass. So he, he got the wise men together one day and he said, you made my life miserable because I'm more happy than I'm sad. And every time I look at the ring, I realize that my happy days will pass too. <laughs> so he condemned the few that feel them to death. So this uh, business about this too shall pass applies to our second presentation today. Uh, and we forget that we are, we all know the sayings, the memento mori, the sic gloria mundi, uh, all the phrases over the years that we've used to remind us of mortality and how life passes and that we're not invincible. And yet I was in the changing room a few weeks ago and a fellow plastic surgeon was changing and I heard the rattle of a bottle and he took out about it must be 60 or 70 pills, and he swallowed them. It was 7.30 in the morning. And I said, what are you taking? I can't imagine you're that ill. He says, oh, vitamin this, vitamin that, blah, blah, blah. It's supposed to anti-age and reduce your aging, all this sort of business. And I think we forget the fact that we are, after all, mortals, and that the multiplication of our, of our cells has, a, has a, an infinite number of times that we can split before our cells die. So that comes into play in our second discussion. As far as the first discussion goes, when we talk about diseases, we mustn't simply talk about what's the best treatment. There's an organization called NICE, which is uh, present in the UK, and there are similar organizations in Europe, National Institute of, uh, of Clinical Excellence. We don't have such an organization in the United States. It's high time we had one. And what NICE does is it looks at those treatments that give you the most cost-effective results in a disease management process. So if something is excessively expensive and it only helps a very few patients for a very short time, they do not allow you to use it. I think this is not a matter of death panels. It is a very sensible approach. The converse to that is if you have a, if you have a treatment that really works very well, an insurance company can't say to you, you can't use this because the NICE organization basically tells you this is the best treatment for it, there's, there's published proof that works. So before I let, uh, let the first uh, presentation uh, be, be given, I want you to just listen to this little summary from the paper that was published just three or four years ago. This was forwarded to us by Professor Zone. This control study had six patients who were in the study group and six patients were in the control group. It was easy to choose the patients that fell into the control group. 
because these were the patients who were refused the immunosuppressive treatment that we requested from the insurance companies, so they automatically fell into the control group. All six of these patients were blind in both eyes. As it happens, the study group went on to show or was suspected from other case reports that, by the way, have been around for about 12 years, that you can save vision in at least one, if not both eyes, to a very significant extent and leave people independent. This is something we're dealing with in 2016. We still have this problem of treatment, controls, who can we treat, who can't we treat. So, so the, first, the first disease we're discussing is one that we all need to put our minds to as to what do we do, what do we change, how do we treat. And I hope most of you got a chance to see one of the two patients we're presenting upstairs. Uh, Juice is going to present the first one and Stag the second one. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to see the patient upstairs, um, that's ca case number one that I'm going to go over briefly. Uh, there's a lot of different dates and details about the case, but I'll just try to summarize them as concisely as possible. So case one, um, <clears throat> she's a 57-year-old woman with history of diabetes. She presented back in February of 2015 to her optometrist. Uh, complaining of ocular irritation and sensitivity over the past three months. Uh, she'd actually been taping her lower eyelids to her cheeks because she'd been, she found that that had uh, improved her irritation. At that time, I just wanted, this is important just to see where she started. Her vision was 2070 and 2040 with correction. She had some corneal staining that day and, and bilateral lower lid entropion. Uh, she was referred to oculoplastic service here at Marin. Uh, about a month, you know, six weeks later, she uh, arrived at her oculoplastics consultation. She said both her lids were bothering her, but she had denied any previous problem with her lids. Um, at that time, without correction, so this may not be as, as bad as it actually is, it was 2150 and 2100 uh, in right and left eyes. She was diagnosed with bilateral lower lid cicatricial entropion, and about two weeks later, she underwent a bilateral lower lid entropion repair and actually had a conjunctival biopsy of both lower eyelids at that time. Um, this was repaired using a lateral tarsal strip uh, technique and a reinsertion of lower lid retractors. Um, this is a picture right before surgery, so you can see she's taped her lower lids here. Uh, a lot of conjunctival uh, hyperemia and injection and bilateral lower lid entropians here with, uh, with the lashes touching the, the eye there. Um, so the biopsy results came back a few days later from dermatopathology. Uh, the right uh, conjunctival biopsy was completely normal. Uh, it showed some connective tissue fibers here, but in terms of the uh, immunoglobulins here, they were all negative. So the, this really shows the utility of taking two biopsies in a patient, which was done here and, and very wisely. Uh, and it shows the predominance of IgG, IgG4 uh, in the basement membrane zone and also IgA. Uh, so the interpretation from uh, the dermatology department was that this uh, was a predominantly IgA, uh, but also linear IgG making a diagnosis of, diagnosis of pemphigoid and specifically linear IgA disease. Uh, so after the po positive biopsy, this patient was called several times to the office to discuss the results. Unfortunately, she didn't show up um, several times, and we actually made a formal appointment after the biopsy was, was confirmed to, uh, to discuss this with her, and she show, didn't show up a third time. Um, so patient obviously lost the follow-up, which uh, will show why she progressed here. So she finally made it to the office a couple months after the biopsy. Um, and she's reporting that she could not look up at that time. You can see her vision drop to count fingers, counting fingers in her right eye, uh, and a little bit worse in her left eye as well. Uh, we uh, requested an urgent referral to dermatology with Dr. Zone, who's present here today. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, we decided to have her follow up with us, and she canceled her appointment, missed her dermatology appointment with Professor Zone. Um, so you can see the kind of the pattern here of, of uh, poor follow up. Um, Urgently, she called in a couple, a month and a half later, um, saying that she was having problems. No specific uh, specifics to that, but she'd actually developed bilateral corneal ulcers and upper lid entropion with trachiasis. And here's a picture of how she looked when she called in that day. These are the quote problems that she was having. Uh, it's quite obvious what's going on: bilateral ulcers, a uh, ton of ton of inflammation here in the conjunctiva with early fibrosis, and uh, you can see this symblepharon formation and shortening the inferior fornix. So we urgently sent her to the, <coughs> excuse me, the cornea service. Uh, at that point time, she was just light, bare light perception in both eyes. The left eye was soft. However, the, the anterior chamber was formed, um, but, it was, but it was shallow. They didn't see an active leak, but they suspected that there was kind of an intermittent slow leak 
from that left eye. Uh, at that point, cultures were taken, um, which grew uh, staph aureus, or excuse me, just staph. I don't remember exactly what bug, but staph. Uh, she started on fortified vancomycin drops, also doxycycline and vitamin C to, to help with the corneal ulcers. Uh, the next day, she underwent an upper lid entropion repair uh, by this modified Trabu procedure, uh, and also tr the trachiasis was treated with the Elman unit to both lower lids. Um, she got in to see Professor Zone um, later that week. Uh, at that time, a history revealed that she'd been suffering from severe dysphagia, uh, blistering of her throat and mouth, uh, and actually had been reporting vaginal symptoms for years, but those are unclear if that's candid candida versus uh, you know, actual uh, blistering uh, in the vagina. She was started on Dapsone, 25 milligrams daily, and we, uh, they submitted an uh, insurance request here for IVIG and rituximab infusions, and we'll go over uh, that's the article Dr. Uh, Patel was alluding to before, uh, and we'll go over uh, the benefit of those treatments. So her labs, uh, after she saw uh, Dr. Zone, I'll go over this in more detail too, but there's an ELISA serum test that you can use to detect uh, abnormal IgG antibodies, and hers were obviously in the abnormal range here in red. Um, <clears throat> she also had uh, positive titers of both IgA and IgG in the basement membrane zone. And the interpretation of this is similar to the conjunctival biopsy, a mixed pattern of IgG and IgA. Uh, and this uh, was interpreted by Dr. Zone to say maybe this has implications for her disease severity and possibly treatment monitoring. So in the meantime, the next couple of weeks, she was following up with cornea and oculoplastics, and she had progressive thinning, neovascularization, conjunctivalization, some blepharon. Uh, and I'll show some pictures of that. She started an oral prednisone to try to prevent uh, further scarring. And then you can see the timeline here up until I think she saw Dr. Zone here on the 14th. A couple of weeks later, she finally started uh, rituximab, no IVIG, but with solumedrol. Here's a picture of how she looked the next month. You can still see this persistent staining of her corneas. This is after the upper lid procedure. You see a nice eversion of the upper lids with the lashes away from the corneas. That's really important. And you can actually see some uh, you know, recurrence of the entropion on the lower lids. Uh, here as well. So just some following of her labs. Um, we increased her Z, uh, we increased her Dapsone further, and followed this BP one eighty lab that I referred to before, uh, and it's is on a trend downwards. Um, however, because it was not completely normalized, they considered starting IVIG, which was not started. Um, overall, she refused. Uh, she received eight infusions of rituximab, as we followed her labs. Uh, here's how she looks just last month in December. You can see this basically end-stage disease here with conjunctivalization and scarring of the corneas, keratinization, uh, severe symblepharon, and you can see that's how she looks today as well. Here's just from a couple weeks ago. This is how she looks today. You can see this basically 360 degrees of, of symblepharon uh, and shortening of the fornix here, just complete obliteration of the fornix. So very kind of end-stage picture here. So the future plans for her, there's nothing, nothing definite, but we are planning, Dr. Patel is planning some more lid surgery for her uh, next month um, with a fornix reconstruction and, and a lower lid reconstruction as well. Um, in the meantime, she's been kept on Dapsone lubrication uh, with erythromycin ointment and also a low-dose prednisone. Um, we continue to epilate her lashes just to try to pr protect the cornea. And then she's visited with cornea and the, the possible options and, and Cornea can comment on this uh, later on, but it's possibly a keratolimbal autograft with a transplant or possibly a keratoprosthesis, and we'll discuss a little bit about that later. I just want to talk briefly about case number two, who's not here today, but um, a little bit different case um, given his long history, but he's a 75-year-old man with a uh, history of diabetes. He was diagnosed uh, with mucous membrane pemphigoid uh, 12 years ago based on a pharyngeal biopsy. Uh, this was formally diagnosed as linear IgA bullous dermatosis. Uh, he also has a history of uh, glaucoma in the right eye with steroid response. He's also had cataract surgery in the right eye. <clears throat> he was previously treated with cyclophosphamide and prednisone. He later went off of those immunosuppressants and then was restarted on Celsept um, a couple of years later. Uh, I think the last time he had been on immunosuppression was about 2009. Uh, his visual acuity after his first uh, bad, bad flare of, of pemphigoid, he ended up blind, basically blind in the left eye, counting fingers. His right eye did not uh, suffer any bad scarring or disease, so he's fortunate to keep, keep his one eye. Um, in 2010, he had some, some blepharon surgery, but 
he basically uh, represented over Christmas uh, in 2014 with new blistering in his nose, mouth, and, and, and irritation of his eyes. Um, over uh, almost about a month later, he received, he, he received a rituximab infusion. And the same lab was drawn here. Nine is kind of the cutoff of normal, but you can see this is uh, elevated because uh, below nine is normal. And then he also had elevated uh, BP-230. Uh, he received another rituximab infusion. These are the only two infusions he received as far as I can, uh, can tell from the records. His right eye dropped from 20, 30, 20, 40 all the way to hand motion. So now he's effectively blind in both eyes, uh, legally blind in both eyes. He was seen uh, in the dermatology clinic. And this is, I'll, I'll point out, this gentleman's from St. George. So it's he had difficult, difficulty coming up to Salt Lake City uh, and follow up. So that was one kind of uh, impedance to treatment here. Uh, he was started on dapsone, 50 milligrams a day, and prednisone. Over the course of three months, he received um, three courses of solumedrol, as well as, as some courses of IVIG that I'll show later. Uh, and then we followed his labs. Um, his BP-180 dropped down to the normal range, and so did the BP-230. Uh, he was kept on dapsone. And at that point, because of his antibodies were negative, there was no more rituximab was recommended. Um, his ocular surface was protected and, and tried to be treated with prednisone, restasis, and tears. Uh, and we also kept him on his alphagan to try to limit the damage due to his glaucoma. Uh, he received a total, due to the records, a total of 17 IVIG treatments. I don't have the exact dates of those in, in the records, though, however. Um, back in September, he had an ocular surface reconstruction with Dr. Patel. Uh, the plan for him was to try to blunt the inflammatory response by using prednisone uh, a couple of days prior and up to two weeks after uh, in a taper. However, the patient was confused about these instructions and did not do it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the procedure uh, Dr. Patel performed was a mucous membrane graft. He resected some scarring from his cornea. In that case, it improved to 2050 from this uh, count fingers, hand motions type vision he had. So, a good improvement, but we'll see what happens. Three weeks postoperatively, you can see some uh, chemosis and edema here uh, where the reconstruction took place. But his cornea is fairly clear. You don't see that neovascularization. Uh, his lashes look like they're in pretty good position away from the cornea. Uh, and then about seven weeks post-op, you can see this you know, progressive subepithelial fibrosis, shortening of his fornix. Uh, he's got some irregular epithelium here and this beginning of this conjunctivalization of his cornea here. So. Um, Unfortunately, it sounds, it sounds like the procedure did not uh, particularly take well, uh, and he's starting to progress despite uh, immunomodulation. So uh, he was on the dapsone, but he developed anemia. He developed some heart problems as well. He was, he was taken off the dapsone. Um, and we saw him over Christmas time, and at that time, Professor Zone planned for further rituximab infusions in IVIG. Uh, every month for six months. And I don't know if this has been approved or not. He's Professor Zone, getting it now. He's getting it now? Okay. Uh, so that's good news. And then from the cornea standpoint, um, what to do with this gentleman, kind of the same plan, possibly limbal autograft versus a K-Pro. Um, so that's where we stand with him. So any comments from the audience so far just on these two cases? Maybe Dr. Patel or Professor Zone have any comments, of anything I missed? I have a lot of comments. Yeah. Go ahead and okay. Sure. So I'm just going to review uh, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. Um, so mucous membrane pemphigoid is a group of chronic inflammatory and blistering diseases. They affect the mouth, pharynx, larynx, uh, genital and anal mucosa. Um, you, it's characterized by these linear deposits of IgG, IgA, or complement 3 in the basement membrane zone of the epithelium. Uh, OCP is a type of mucous membrane pemphigoid that presents as a chronic cicatrizing conjunctivitis. Um, the epidemiology of this, it's relatively rare disease, however, um, uh, incidence is quoted between 1 in 8,000 and maybe 1 in 46,000 in ophthalmic patients. Uh, there's differing, differing numbers on there, but they usually range in, that, in, that, in those numbers. There's no geographic or racial predilection. The average age of diagnosis is, is el you know, more, more elderly patients, 60 to 70 years old. Um, however, this disease may smolder along and, and prevent, present as kind of just a chronic low-grade low conjunctivitis for years and years before patients actually declare themselves or, or undergo a biopsy. Uh, patients that are younger uh, may present with more severe or uh, rapidly progressive disease. There's a slight female to male um, uh, increase in the ratio there. Uh, and it's actually rare in children. There's only less than, fewer than 20 patients reported uh, in the pediatric literature. 
pathogenesis of this. So it is a systemic autoimmune disorder. You can see of all the other sites that are involved. Um, there is an aberrant production of antibodies against antigens in the mucosal epithelial basement membrane zone. There are several targets that have been identified. This is a uh, beta-4 of alpha-6 beta-4 integrin is uh, one that's commonly uh, cited in the literature. And then this is the other one that I was referring to uh, that people use to detect in the serum um, for possibly uh, to, to follow the disease to see their response to treatment uh, if it is positive. Um, so there's a couple of theories of, of why this occurs. Um, basically, there's uh, these autoantibodies bind to these uh, antigens in the basement membrane zone, and this stimulates an inflammatory cascade, release of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and pro-fibrotic cytokines, which lead to scarring. Um, there's a couple of proposed theories, but nothing's uh, particularly been proven. There is some HLA haplotypes that have been associated with it. Um, and there's also some links to um, topical ophthalmic and systemic medications, but they term these as pseudopemphigoid. And a lot of the glaucoma medications that I'll point out later uh, have been shown to uh, be associated with this. Um, the presentation, the ophthalmic findings, uh, they can be unilateral, um, as, as in the second case, the gentlemen seem to have unilateral presentation. Uh, but bilateral involvement is usually within two to four years. Uh, the eye is the first site of involvement in one third of these patients. Um, and they typically present with a chronic or relapsing conjunctivitis, redness, tearing, burning, uh, decrease in vision, mucus drainage, form body sensation, et cetera. Uh, the extraocular findings are present uh, or in the oral cavity in about 42% of patients with uh, erosive gingivitis and uh, erosions of the buccal mucosa, et cetera. Uh, it can also present in the nose, pharynx, larynx, uh, and, and other areas in the body. Non-mucosal skin sites can also be involved in 16%. Uh, and then it, it, this, you have to remember this is actually a potentially lethal disease. Patients can asphyxiate from esophageal or tracheal stricture. Um, so it's something to keep in mind that this is just not localized to the eye. It can be, it can be deadly. This is a couple pictures that you may uh, have the patient open their mouth uh, and see this kind of inflammatory response here of the, of the gingiva. Uh, and this is frank uh, blistering uh, and ulceration of the, gin, of the gingiva here. This is a kind of a confusing uh, diagram I put together to confuse you all, but um, so it basically starts with the infl inflammatory process and leading to subepithelial fibrosis. And then there's three little, three areas here that you can go down, but they are all usually involved. There's these lid changes that cause uh, malposition of the lids and lashes. There's the conjunctival changes that lead to shrinkage, some blepharon and possibly ankylobleferon. And then there's also destruction of the tear film in all three aspects of the, of the tear film, the goblet cells, meibomian glands, and the uh, you know, eccrine glands. So what does this lead to? It leads to a dry eye state, um, leads to malposition of the lids, abnormal blinking, and mechanical trauma from the lashes, uh, and exposure keratopathy. And then eventually the end stage is this corneal keratinization, neovascularization, conjunctivalization, uh, scarring, and eventual blindness. So the uh, staging uh, of this disease is proposed by uh, Dr. Foster in the 80s. Uh, stage one, this has been also been modified, however, stage one is a chronic inflammatory state with mucus discharge. He uses rose bengal as a staining uh, and shows subepithelial fibrosis. I'll show some pictures of this next. Uh, stage two is foreshortening of the inferior fornix, and this can be graded A through D depending on a percentage of how much it is shortened. Uh, Symblephron uh, is the next stage and also graded as a percentage A through D. And stage four is the end stage, um, and I'll show a picture of that. And I think that's the category you'd put our patient upstairs in. So here's a picture of stage one disease. You see this white band underneath the conjunctiva here. This is some beginnings of subepithelial fibrosis, so this is kind of chronic conjunctival inflammation here. <clears throat> stage two, you see some foreshortening of the inferior fornix here. It's not as deep as it should be. Inferior fornix is usually involved first, as it was in our patients. <coughs> this is stage three. You can see the symblephron formation here. Uh, not all the way across, but you can see a focal area of symblephron. And then stage four, just horrible, horrible disease, keratinization of the cornea, scarring, conjunctivalization, neovascularization, opacity of the cornea, uh, ankyloblephron, just a complete obliteration here of the fornix. Uh, just very, very sad end stage picture here. 
Uh, in terms of diagnosis, uh, a biopsy uh, is typically what people do. Um, a lot of people actually go ahead and biopsy an extraocular site if it's involved. If this is negative, there is high suspicion for, for the disease. Then the bul bulbar conjunctiva is frequently used. Uh, I, I believe, I don't know where the biopsy is taken from in your case of our patient upstairs, Dr. Patel. Was that inferior conjunctiva? Inferior conjunctiva, okay. Um, they recommend taking a perilesional biopsy to avoid false negatives. You don't want to biopsy the super, super inflamed conjunctiva that may just show chronic inflammation and scarring and not give you the, uh, the picture you're looking for. Uh, negative biopsy, however, does not exclude the diagnosis of OCP. Uh, direct immunofluorescence is done on all specimens, um, at least at this institution. Uh, it is 52% sensitive. Um, however, if it's negative, then they suggest using immunoperoxidase staining, which increases the sensitivity to 83%. Um, and then positive immun immunohistochemistry does not rule out other diagnoses, such as epidermolysis bullous acquisata or linear IgA bullous dermatosis. So here's a picture of, of what you'd see uh, on the direct immunofluorescence. This is standing positively for IgG in the basement membrane zone here. You can also see some other areas that look positive. However, this is normally uh, in con inflamed conjunctivitis. IgG is found in the conjunctiva. There's also IgG found in the substantia propria here in normal specimens. But this is what you're looking for here at the basement membrane zone. So this is the test I was referring to earlier, the BP180 uh, and BP230. This is an ELISA test. Um, the serum levels of this IgG, um, basically BP-180 and BP-230 are these uh, molecular structures found in the basement membrane zone that serve as antigens for the, the IgG to bind to. Uh, they're in the negative range in normal individuals. Um, these antibodies are present uh, in about 80% of bolus pemphigoid patients and 20% of mucous membrane pemphigoid patients. It is highly sensitive and specific for pemphigoid. So this is just a, a long list of the d differential diagnosis of a chronic cicatrizing conjunctivitis. The things that we uh, as ophthalmologists would probably see more often would be maybe an atopic keratoconjunctivitis, ocular rosacea, and there's actually a lot of association with uh, pseudopemphigoid and topical glaucoma medication use. You know, a lot of patients have intolerance of their glaucoma medications. You try switching medications, they still have conjunctival inflammation. You may want to put this pseudopemphigoid type picture on your differential. Uh, when you have a patient like that. Uh, pseudopemphigoid, the biopsy is negative uh, for the uh, linear staining that we showed. Uh, however, the topical glaucoma medications and systemic practolol, which is a beta blocker we don't really use anymore, uh, has been associated with this. And this is just a paper that showed the uh, proportion of patients with drug-induced pseudopemphigoid and what drops they're on. It's kind of small here, but the, the top of the list here was the beta blockers. Next was alpha agonist, then it goes down with pilocarpine, myotics and then latanoprost and the uh, carbonic anhydrase are the lowest. But beta blockers top the list here in terms of topical glaucoma medications presenting as a pseudopemphigoid picture. So the goals of treatment in pemphigoid, um, number one, suppress and control inflammation. Is this a systemic disease? This is your first and most important um, uh, goal of treatment. Uh, second is to promote healing. Number three, to prevent cicatrization. Uh, we cannot reverse scarring, but we can hopefully prevent further scarring. 75% um, of these patients may require systemic immunosuppression. Uh, other tenets of treatment, uh, it, like I said, is a systemic disease, first and foremost. Uh, immunosuppressive therapy should be administered only by those with experience. Uh, not many of us ophthalmologists have experience with these immunomodulatory therapies. However, there are other medical subspecialists that we frequently uh, work with that are very experienced in this. Um, Make the appropriate referrals. This patient is, these patients need to see a cornea specialist, someone that's very skilled in the anterior segment, uh, reconstruction perhaps down the line. Uh, oculoplastics needs to be very, very involved. And also at this institution, we frequently work with dermatology or basically always work with dermatology because of the systemic uh, medications needed and it is a systemic disease. Uh, these patients do need to commit to frequent follow-up. That was a big problem in our patient here. Um, both the physician and the patient need to commit to, to having frequent follow-ups here. So the treatment, um, there's some stepwise treatments that have been proposed. Um, in talking with Professor Zone in his articles that he's written, the mild to moderate ocular disease, um, you provide ocular care. Uh, patients are typically started on DAP zone between 50 and 200 milligrams a day for about 12 weeks. There is less data on methotrexate, salsept, azathioprine, but these have also been used with success in these patients. 
Um, severe refractory disease, uh, traditionally they've been used with cyclophosphamide and prednisone. Uh, cyclophosphamide does take a while to work, therefore your patients are covered with prednisone. The role of steroids in this disease, um, both of our patients were on oral prednisone. A lot of that is to try to uh, kind of cover them while they're getting uh, heavier systemic immunosuppression. But it can also control scarring, but it's not enough to control this disease activity. And basically the side effect profile of prednisone is not something that you'd keep patients on long term. Um, I'll discuss IVIG and rituximab here, but the basics of it is it can shorten the duration of conventional therapy in a study. It, it, it uh, reduced the duration of therapy from eight to four months. Rituximab can provide long-lasting improvement in three-quarters of the patients over 24 months. And then there's a combination of IVG and rituximab. So that's what uh, our second patient received. Uh, here's the paper by uh, Dr. Foster's group. Um, that Dr. Patel alluded to before, six of six of patients in the control in the study group had no progression of their pemphigoid disease and had no changes in their best corrective visual acuity. That's really great numbers, even though it's a small sample size. Uh, and then six of six of the control patients, those patients were put on um, infliximab, uh, cyclophosphamide, and uh, IVIG, I believe. Uh, these patients, six of six, became bilaterally blind. There's no adverse effects noted from the uh, rituximab group patients. In terms of ophthalmic care, um, when you see a patient like this, aggressive, aggressive lubrication is very, very important. Um, some authors propose use of uh, protecting the ocular surface with a bandage contact lens to prevent mechanical irritation from the lashes. Punctal occlusion is, a, is an option to provide more uh, lubrication to the ocular surface. Topical steroids, cyclosporine, cyclosporine tacrolimus, there's kind of a limited role to those, however, they, can, they won't control the disease uh, effectively, but they can uh, possibly uh, limit the amount of scarring in, in the eye. Uh, also, it's important to treat patients for blepharitis to try to optimize their uh, tear secretion. Uh, management of trachiasis and dystochiasis this can be done in the office by epilating lashes, however, this is something that needs to be done monthly. Uh, and there's also, uh, just to keep in mind, as an ophthalmologist, there's a high association of OCP and glaucoma. Some papers say up to 25% of patients actually have glaucoma that have this disease as well. Um, there's a little confusion. Is, is this you know, a glaucoma medication-induced picture of OCP, or is there just actually an association between the two diseases? It's not really totally understood. The surgical considerations. For these patients, you want to make sure they're completely, completely quiet before doing any type of surgery on them, at least six weeks prior. Uh, some studies you'll see that patients have been, been on uh, disease-modifying therapy for over a year to try to control their disease before any surgery is tried. Uh, perioperative oral steroids, as we suggested in our second patient. Uh, lid procedures are typically addressed first if there's a stage procedure to be done with ocular surface reconstruction. Uh, and then some authors recommend continu continued immunosuppression postoperatively for at least six months um, to try to prevent the uh, nidus of inflammation from, from creeping out there. Eyelid surgery, there's several techniques recommended for entropion repair, um, which we won't go over. Um, <clears throat> trachiasis, and several techniques used to, uh, to relieve that. Some blepharons, some, uh, Dr. Foster recommends just a simple lysis of some blepharon with a some blepharon ring placement. Uh, and there's also techniques for fornix reconstruction and several things uh, available for use here. Mucous membrane grafting, amniotic membrane transplantation is quite popular anchoring sutures to try to deepen the fornix. And then some, some people have actually used mitomycin C um, to try to prevent the, uh, the scarring effect. Uh, that is, of course, not without complications with scleral melting and persistent epithelial defects, so that needs to be used very cautiously. Uh, this is a paper um, from a couple years back. Um, I think they had seven patients that they did 11 eyes and repaired the entropion. And just this, there's a lot of text here, but the, basically the highlights of this is that the preoperative immunosuppression was so, so important. These patients had a mean preoperative immunosuppression of over 15 months. So it just goes to show these patients need to be so, so well controlled before any surgery is tried. Uh, they also um, really pushed for uh, ocular surface pre protection preoperatively with bandage contact lenses, local and topical therapy, and oral prednisone to try to prevent scarring. Uh, then these patients underwent lid construction, and then postoperatively they had... Uh, they used immunosuppression for at least six months. So this just goes through the things I just mentioned on the last slide. And all their patients had surgical success. success. They had no disease progression, control of inflammation, uh, and I believe their follow-up was over two years.
So in terms of cornea options, I'm not a cornea specialist, but there are several uh, papers out there on, on what to do in these patients. Uh, ocular surface reconstruction with amniotic membrane. Uh, limbal stem cell transplantation has been moderately successful. There's a study of 11 patients where six of them were successful. Uh, penetrating keratoplasty and lamellar keratoplasty, uh, pretty poor success in the literature. And then there's the option of keratoprosthesis. Type 1 has a very, very poor retention rate at three years, and uh, you know, not many patients better than 2,200. Type 2 keratoprosthesis, where it actually goes through the lid, uh, has a much higher retention rate at three years and better visual acuity overall. And so there's also some reports of using osteodontal keratoprosthesis. However, in these chronic cicatrizing diseases, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid is kind of towards the bottom in terms of success with osteodontal keratoprosthesis. So what about cataract surgery? Some of these, some of these patients are going to go on to, to recover and, and be quiet for a while, and then they may develop cataracts from being on chronic steroids, et cetera, um, and just in the age group they're in. So I think it's important just to keep technique in mind. Clear corneal incisions are very, very important here. You want to try to manipulate the conjunctiva as, as minimally as possible. Uh, there are some case series that uh, document that the surgery can be very successful in OCP patients, uh, but they do recommend perioperative steroids before, after for at least 10 days. Um, these patients also should be on their, if they're on chemotherapeutic agent, uh, at least six months postoperatively. And then, of course, you, judicious use of topical steroids with probably slow taper. Um, the prognosis um, for these patients, it is a slowly progressive disease. Uh, over 10 to 30 years in most cases. Uh, you would like to try to attempt to cease therapy after two years of, of patients being quiet. Um, there are long periods of remission off therapy achievable in about a third of patients. However, the relapse rate is unpredictable and these patients may flare just out of the blue. Um, and some, some studies say that up to 30% of patients with advanced conjunctival fibrosis do eventually become blind. And like I said, it's kind of unpredictable, and, but despite you know, optimum immunosuppression, some of these patients still progress. You know, our patients both received uh, rituximab and adequate immunosuppression. However, both of our patients are unfortunately effectively legally blind at this point. Um, some of the problems that I uh, encountered through going through these cases of our two patients, so this is a very complex disease. There's multiple uh, specialists involved, different doctors, different clinics. Um, sometimes it's hard to know who is, who is it appropriate to refer to. When do we have to refer these patients? How soon do they need to be seen? Um, do they have to see a certain doctor? Can they see somebody else? Um, there are insurance issues and delays that uh, I think definitely played a, played a role in this, these cases. Uh, and unfortunately, the patients pay the price for that. Um, there's also uh, access to care issues with our patient being from St. George and maybe not being able to come up here as often. Our other patient was maybe a little bit confused about the importance of follow-up uh, and no-showed several appointments. Um, these patients just need to make sure that they're aware that this is a lifelong disease that they need very, very regular follow-up for. Uh, some of my conclusions, so like I said, this is a systemic autoimmune condition. Patients need prompt delivery of immunomodulatory therapy. And I think overall the university needs a better system as a whole to care for these patients. Some institutions have what's called a corneoplastic unit or corneoplastic team. I think a, maybe a better collaboration between the cornea team and the plastics team to make sure these patients are seen maybe on the same day or maybe in conjunction with one another uh, and discussed and, and what the treatment plan would, would better uh, serve these patients. Um, obviously, we work very closely with dermatology and Professor Zone. Um, I think maybe understanding uh, the referral process and how, how to get these patients better seen uh, more efficiently, more quickly, uh, would also better serve these patients. Um, are there other physicians besides Professor Zone that if Professor Zone's unavailable for some reason that we can see and get this patient in quicker? Uh, I think that would also help the patients. And then, of course, we all have problems with insurance, um, but Professor Zone might be able to comment on this because he's probably intimately familiar with the insurance process of, of getting rituximab and IVIG approved, but making sure starting the insurance process very early and if there's a system that we could use to, to try to expedite that for these patients. Uh, of course, rituximab is approved for lymphoma and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. It's not approved for this disease by the FDA, so insurance companies aren't necessarily too excited to approve this for an off-label type use. So. 
um, that's obviously a, a kind of a barrier to treatment as well. So I'd open any comments here. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, Dr. Lin. So I just want to make two comments. I'm glad that you um, emphasized the importance of preoperative systemic immunosuppression. Um, because even with clear corneal cataract surgery, if someone is, has OCP and is not immunosuppressed, you can cause complete conjunctivalization just with clear corneal cataract surgery. Okay. Um, the second comment is that um, I was at a Boston k so was meeting at the Boston Academy. And the um, numbers that they were giving as far as the success rates of Boston k with OCP was even more dismal than what you have presented. So they're saying that the type 1 k which is the more common type, has a 100% chance of failure in OCP. Okay. And the type 2 k which goes through the lid, has an 80% chance of failure. Okay. So that's even worse. worse. Than what you presented, but I mean, I don't know where those numbers had specifically come from, but that was the general consensus. Yeah, those were, those are just the, um, Exposure rates, I believe, and not necessarily, I mean, I guess that's a failure, but those are over three years. I don't know how long their, their study was, but Dr. Mbadi. Um, I had a few comments. So I, I second thing you said in terms of the K-Pro, Dr. Goldman has told me don't ever use the K-Pro. <laughs> um, I have a few comments. First, um, we do have an IVIG subconjunctival injection clinical trial that is open here, so uh, for a patient like this, Um, second, uh, topical of hydroxyprogesterone and topical of vitamin A ointment can be useful for these patients to help uh, reduce the characterization and help improve the efficacy of the patient. Um, third, I believe Genentech does have a patient assistance program. Uh, you have to check into whether the patient will be eligible for that. And Jim Rosenbaum in Oregon has an open clinical trial for rituxan or OCP, so I think the medicine is free for Um, lastly, just to give Boopy some heartburn because I enjoy doing that, um, uh, Rutuxin is, uh, uh, I just checked the NICE website, Rutuxin in the UK is approved by NICE for, as Zach mentioned, similar to Cleavis with rheumatoid arthritis and anchovasculitis, so it's not approved for uh, OCP. Um, and so, uh, like other biologics and extensive chemotherapies, uh, they're often not available in, in, in the UK, and uh, NICE is not. Okay. In that clinical trial in Oregon, patients would have to travel to that site? I uh, know it's a multi center. Okay. Professor okay, So uh, I've dealt with this a lot for the past uh, 40 years, so I have a lot of comments. Um, five minutes? Please. Is that enough? Okay. Um, to start out with the diagnosis, in the first case, he showed something Sorry. very, very bothersome to us. We get about 1,800 specimens from around the country a year, and I would say probably 10% of those are conjunctival biopsies, maybe 5%, but we get a lot of them. We, we do the uh, reference laboratory serology and uh, direct immunofluorescence for ERUP. Um, what, was, what he showed was that one eye was negative and one was positive. That's very, very bothersome because making the diagnosis is very important. Only about 20% of the people are positive on serum. I would say 80% are negative. So the first thing is making the diagnosis. And biopsying conjunctiva that is not so inflamed is very important, as he mentioned. Because the inflammation, if there's intense inflammation, it'll destroy the immunoreactants that we're trying to find on direct immunofluorescence. Uh, and then it becomes a false negative. Or if some people, actually, we can tell they send us little scars. They send us a piece of the symblephron, for example. Um, those are almost universally negative. Scarring is, is a bad place to biopsy. If you can get relatively quiet conjunctiva, I know a lot of these people don't really have quiet conjunctiva, but stay away from the scar and stay away from the, the bright red stuff. Uh, we have a much higher chance of positivity and we can increase that by 20%. We don't really know. Uh, Stephen Foster, I've had a lot of conversations with him and the article you were talking about in Up to Date, I edit that and he contributed that. We've had conversations about it and he's certainly an expert and he's done everything to try to increase his positivity uh, by those immunoperoxidase stains that you mentioned up to 70%. So just because it's negative doesn't mean they don't have it and the second biopsy may be in order 
uh, depending upon what your clinical suspicion is and other causes of cicatrizing conjunctivitis. Obviously, those people who uh, have uh, pseudopempagoid uh, are, for the most part, going to be negative and are always a, a concern of ours. Um, because the, especially the ones we get in the mail, we have no idea what things are on or anything like that. Uh, so first point was diagnosis. The second thing is 30 to 40 percent of the people have mucosal disease elsewhere. We biopsy inside the mouth, the gingiva, I do it all the time. If people have a little scar in their mouth and their eye, or their eyes are pink, I'll biopsy their mouth. So uh, if they have even a little bit of mouth disease, we do a lot, we reported uh, uh, eight people with esophageal stenosis back in the 90s, and we biopsy the esophagus, anything to get a piece to make certain of the diagnosis. Especially those people who have IgA, it turns out, are more sensitive to Dapsone than people who have IgG. So diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis really helps us. Like in this case, when you can see the antibody levels going down in response to your treatment, that kind of warms your heart from, a, from an immunotherapy standpoint. So my entire clinical career has been devoted to immunosuppressing people. And I would say probably 60% of the people I see are immunosuppressed. And I've treated probably a couple hundred people with Rituxan. I don't notch my belt, so I don't really know. I see a lot of pemphigus and a lot of pemphigoid. Um, so I would emphasize mucous membrane involvement. If they have, just look in their mouth if, or ask them, do they have trouble swallowing? Do they have sores in their mouth? Because if they do, we can get a biopsy and make a diagnosis. Um, the next thing is treatment. As was alluded to, the, the reflex is always to treat them with a lot of steroids. That will cut down on the inflammation, but it doesn't really stop progression of the disease, and it doesn't get rid of the antibody. So it boils down to immunosuppression. Back in the 90s, the only thing we had was that worked was cyclophosphamide, and Foster and the people at Hopkins would always say, if you don't give them cyclophosphamide, you know, that's bad. Uh, I now have three of those patients that I'm following with bladder cancer, so it's not without its complications, and right now I don't think anyone would give cyclophosphamide. When he was saying that things aren't approved for this, uh, this, is, these, this is an orphan disease. It's going to be very, very unlikely that it's going to get approved. Um, so steroids, immunosuppressives, I don't use much cyclophosphamide anymore. I'm a great believer in Rituxan and IVIG. And as you alluded to, uh, it's a crisis with the insurance. So I, I love that paper that Foster wrote on this topic. Six people got immunosuppression, they're blind. Six people got IVIG plus Rituxan, uh, they can see uh, do you, you're responsible for this, you make the choice. I send them that paper with usually a very nasty note. Uh, and I try to be very nasty to these people on the telephone. Uh, I can sometimes <laughs> gather it up, but it is in my nature. Um, so the, uh, because I, I think if you don't fight for it first, this, the first patient, was obviously negligent. If the woman had come to see us in April when her first appointment was, we might have been able to IVIG this away and, and Rituxan, but she just didn't show up. And she, <laughs> I don't know, she had a, a bizarre opinion of what she had. Um, I personally believe that the best treatment is IVIG and Rituxan. If this institution that runs about uh, uh, 25 to $30,000 a month for that dosing, uh, it's uh, $22,000 a month, or $11,000 for the IVIG, $11,000 for the Rituxan, and it's about uh, $1,000 for the infusion expenses. So we're not talking small amounts. It's usually, I figure $30,000 a month for six months is the cost of this. So, you know, it's very important that clinical trials be done to see whether or not it works. Uh, we have a clinical trial on a B cell poison for uh, pemphigus right now, but not for pemphigoids. <clears throat> the other thing that he mentioned that is a real disaster in this area is people who live a distance away. Um, I take care of these people, and I have a junior associate, Dr. Hull, who I've worked with for a number of years, and I'm <clears throat> encouraging him to see more and more of these people, and he is. And, and we see patients together on Thursday afternoons. Uh, so. There is hope to treat them, but I always ask the question when I, I talk about this topic nationally and internationally, actually, and I always ask the question, what would I do if I had this disease? That's the essence of severe immunosuppression and aggressive therapy, because this
this is aggressive therapy. Uh, I've produced two hypogammaglobulinemics who are on IVIG the rest of their life. Uh, I've had some nasty infections. I've never had anybody die on rituximab in the number of people I've treated. Uh, IVIG, I've had thrombi, I've had uh, I've, uh, thrombosis, the superior vena cava. There's not, things have not, th th these things are not without problems. Um, so it's aggressive therapy, but the question still becomes, and the title of the talk I give is, what would I do if I had pemphigoid? Not just skin, but esophageal, oral. And if I had pemphigoid, and if I had pemphigoid in my eye, on day one, I would get, I, I would get rituximab and IVIG. I would just take it for six straight months. And neither of these people, the one lady, the insurance company, agreed to the rituximab and not to the IVIG. And in the second one, they agreed to one course of rituximab and IVIG. And then I sent them the letter, sent them the email or the, uh, the article, and started arguing with them. Um, you know, unfortunately, in our system, insurance companies are making these choices. And the, quote, medical person who is making them is usually a general practitioner or family practitioner of some sort. So that's a real, a real crisis. But I agree with your idea that we should have a, a more uniform approach. When Maureen Lundergan was here, she and I used to meet regularly to discuss these people. But if we could, if we could have more of a, of a group approach, I think we'd be better off uh, on managing them. Because the things that you were saying about corneal repair and, and lid repair, I know virtually nothing about. But you know, I can immunosuppress just about anything. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, so I don't want to leave this hanging. I, I think we should come to some sort of conclusion. I still go to too many meetings where we shake our heads and say, "It's sure it's going to be this, sure it's going to be that." I, I'm beginning to see 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds with positive femphigoid results for biopsies. Um, these people have 40, 50 years of life ahead of them. And we need a team approach where a cornea is interested, plastic is interested. And that immunosuppression, in some places it comes from rheumatology, in other places we're lucky enough to have people like your team uh, that, that needs to be established. We had this problem with melanoma in basin cell. Glenn Bowen and I and, uh, and Tobacco got together a few years ago. We set up a, a website based approach where we have everything available for insurance companies to go to and look things up and we suggest to them that somebody needs a sentinel node biopsy, we still have the same problem with getting approval and so on. And we managed to overcome that by setting up a sort of a unit where we work together. And it's very successful now, and we rarely have problems of getting uh, approval for biopsies, sentinel node biopsies, lymph node dissections, the major facial reconstructions that I do, and so on. And, and I think we need to set this up. If Hal is your man, uh, we'll identify somebody in Cornea who shows genuine interest in this, and I accept that establish a team where, where people can refer these patients to. I'm all for it. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to make that happen from our side. You know, I think that people need to be seen regularly. The other thing he said is, I don't think these people realize the severity of the disease. And I try to, and then they get, you know, oh, well, you're just trying to scare me. No, not really. I mean, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just telling you, this is a nasty problem. And. Um, so whatever, what, do we, what do we need to do as a next step to set that up, do you think, will be? Well, first of all, we're presenting this here because for the last three, four years, I've been frustrated both with Ivan, managed to get him sorted out, this lady, and I've got three young patients now who are positive, and they're beginning to show signs of inflammation coming on, some of them you recognize. Uh, plastics is almost an orphan child here. We're, we're dealing with the end stage, the trichiasis, the entropion. This is a systemic disease. It's inflammation that right. has to be controlled. Uh, so whereas, and, 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 the, and the anterior segment, the, the corneoplastic type of thing, or the conjunctiva cornea, that needs to be actively uh, involved here. There's some controversy about topical subconjunctival, as Bala was saying, some of the subconjunctival injections. We need to be actively involved here. So I think what we'll do between Juice and I is, is contact you and Hal, and then we'll identify amongst our corneo team who might be interested. I used to do a lot of this with uh, Moshefa. As you know, between you and I, Moshefa, we still handle this pretty well. So we just need somebody actively involved where we can say, patient gets seen um, you know, on time every month by all three of us. In an ideal one, we'd have a clinic on the same day. But we can work towards that somehow. So look out for, uh, we'll send you an email. We'll set up a template web page 
uh, and, and have some of this basic information available. When you argue with an insurance company all the time, some of these papers like Foster's paper, there are a few others we didn't discuss which actually show there are more case reports than the, the, the study he did, 6 and 6. Uh, we can have all that data available. So, so in the next month, we'll get this website page set up and, and hopefully we'll identify cornea that's interested in that. We'll, we'll set this up as a, as, a, as, a, as a service that provided when somebody gets a positive biopsy or suspicion of pemphigoid because of the systemic disease, we get it seen by you or us straight away. Dr. Vitale? Yeah, thanks. Emphasize more the uh, importance of preoperative immunosuppression operating on patients like this. I think maybe in the first patient's diagnosis, I don't know, and maybe uh, for some of the reasons why the patient has a rapidly progressive disease. But in terms of the, the collaboration, you know, uh, this is a disease, it's like horrendous uveitis outside of the eye, okay? So it requires a similar approach. And in, at least in the uveitis service, we have kind of a seamless kind of a liaison with uh, rheumatology. So that everybody is on board, and that's been forged over you know years of necessity because we have a very large number of patients as opposed to um, you know the one or two patients with OCP that might come. But it's been uh, we meet on a fairly regular basis, uh, and there's cross fertilization uh, in terms of educating one another about you know the drugs and the diseases, the immunological diseases. So uh, it's a seamless kind of referral that we have with pediatric rheumatology um, with all of the members of that department. And in adult rheumatology, it has been a little bit more difficult, but we have uh, identified individuals that are willing to, you know, take on some of these patients. So part of the problem that you encounter is, you know, you have, you have to suppress the, the patient with you know, heavy duty immunosuppression for indications that, you know, they're not labeled, and it requires a lot of work. And so we work together to try to get these things, you know, the pre-offs and everything and then manage them uh, together. Uh, you know, communication uh, is, is really, really important between you know, treating physicians. So it can, ha it can work, and um, you know, I think it just requires diligence and good communication. We, I have a whole stack, uh, Dr. Zone, of nasty letters to insurance companies, you know, uh, just like you know, Foster does about treating patients. Uh, if you don't use this, you know, Facebook will go online. And, you know, we, I've had instances in which they just refuse, you know, and it's, uh, it's a really bad situation. So. John, the lady upstairs is still active. Did you get a chance to see her today? No, I didn't. So she's still active, and, you know, we've been controlling the trichiasis just with epilation. I don't want to do weaker spectrum grafts yeah, and more aggressive invasion, but she's active like this, so we'll, we'll make sure you get a chance to review that before we. So yeah, I mean, I gave her, the, the insurance company approved eight, eight treatments for protoxin. They wouldn't approve the IVIG. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure her B-cell count is still zero. Um, probably should treat her with IVIG. I, intra, intra uh, or subconjunctival IVIG is a fascinating idea. There's actually uh, papers of uh, intraoral uh, rituximab which makes almost no sense, but uh, intraoral rituximab working uh, sub submucosally. And I wonder, actually wonder, I have a sneaky feeling that intraocular or subconjunctival rituximab would work um, for a whole bunch of reasons that would take me a long time to, to explain, so I won't. Okay. Um, she had, she's had a lot of rituximab. Um, I think if we could get IVIG approved for her, uh, her insurance company under the exchange went broke. That didn't help us. She was insured by Archers, which is one of the groups that wasn't supposed to be backed up by the federal government on the exchange, and they weren't. So it's, you know, somebody's got to come up with 20000 a month if we're going to treat her with IVIG, like we do with the guy in Boise, who you know. See, I, see, I go up to Boise and see Pemphigus and Pemphigoid people every three months just because they were being lost to follow up. I go up there every three months and see them all. Uh, and this guy's been on IVIG forever. It's, it's a struggle. Um, what, is, it, is, Al, is the stuff real expensive that you guys do, or what do you do? Sorry? What do you treat with, is it real expensive? Do you do IVIG and uh, rituximab or anything like that? 
biologic for uh, uveitis? Absolutely, sure, all the time. But not, uh, not so much for tuximab, where there are only a handful of patients that we've treated with tuximab for kind of Portland conditions. But, uh, you know, uh, by, by TNF, uh, I'd rather, you know, uh, tuximab and adalimumab are, we use a lot of GIA. And it's always a, uh, a problem. It's not so much a problem in obtaining approval for those drugs for patients that have an indication. So, for example, children uh, with GIA, but there are, right. there are people that fail conventional immunomodulation that require biological therapy, and and uh, there you have a problem. And that requires, you know, it, it's all insurance de dependent on how aggressive you are uh, in terms of advocating for the patients. Most of the time, we're able to you know, get the, the drug. As far as rituximab is concerned, we have the most common uh, the most common indication for rituximab is actually intravitreal rituximab for patients with intraocular lymphoma. So we don't have a problem with that because we just formulate it here, uh, and we have uh, you know the IRB is approved for that. But um, we have maybe two patients who are on, on rituximab for refractory juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and one patient with autoimmune retinopathy, uh, and one patient with orbital uh, disease. So it's pretty uncommon. It's hard to get it through. Okay. In this, uh, in this bill, Trump and ISIS, refugees, Kardashians, stags, uh, presentation is absolutely excellent. It demands our presence to discuss this in great detail. It actually affects all of us, how we practice as physicians. I don't want to dilute it by having it presented for two minutes. I'm going to organize another special day like this. But it's just as important to talk about the topic that he's going to present as this first one, which I think will actually make a difference to our patient's care. Now that we've had Professor Zoe here, we've got an idea about how to at least put this together and start treatment. So Stag, I'm going to disappoint you, but I do want you to present on the day when I can collect the audience as good as this. Uh, that was a superb uh, presentation. Thanks. Juice, well done. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. I tried.